Hi, what's up guys? You're welcome once again. This is William. In today's video, I'm going to talk about 19 methods for controlling your classroom. So I did a previous video and that particular video, I talked about 10 methods that you can use to control your classroom. Those 10 methods were taken from this particular document that I have and it actually had 19 methods. But because of the time involved, I tried to cram it all together. But today, I'm going to expand on it and I'm going to talk about each and every method one by one. So let's take it from the top. Now, the first one is that kids are competitive. I'm sure you know this already. And this works really well, especially when their ki the kids are a little bigger, maybe five years and above. I've tried this with younger kids and it doesn't work so well because they do not understand the concept of teamwork so well yet. So it doesn't really work well. But for older kids, you can really try this and it works really well. So for example, in the past, what I actually did was group the children into five, into four groups, uh, assigning colors. You could assign a name. You can assign whatever it is. In my case, it was red, yellow, green, and blue. So they knew their teams. They knew what to do. And you can set rules such as whoever talks loses a point, whoever is most quiet gains a point, whoever answers a question gains a point. You know, you can set particular requirements that sets the standards for what they do. And at the end of it all, you can set a particular prize, a reward or something that gives them the motivation to work hard to obey the rules that you set. So one of the things that you can use is that the, is the fact that kids are competitive and you can use that to your advantage. Number two is the use of simple Chinese phrases which request immediate action from the children. So learn some Chinese. Actually, this is not limited to just the Chinese language. Whatever it is that is the local dialect of the people you are teaching, you can actually use the language. This is a little different from English phrases because the children understand really well their local dialect and they have been around it for really long. You can actually use this as a means of class control as they will respond to this quicker. So for example, in Chinese, they can say something like xiao xiao fan zai or put your little hand and the child will say something back, see you guys, huh? you know, like on your knees. Okay. So you can request an action and the, you can request the child to do an, to do something and then they respond and then do the corresponding thing. This is something that the class teachers learn a lot and I actually learned this from the teachers in my school. And similarly in point number three, you can use English simple phrases requesting immediate voice and action. So this is just simple response phrases. You can say something, um, follow me, the child says, follow you, look at me, look at you, listen to me, listen to you, a whole lot of things. There's a whole lot of phrases that you can use to get the attention of the kid. So that's another one. Point number four is rewards. And I feel I don't need to elaborate so much on this particular one because who doesn't love rewards? Rewards is something that is really strategic and really powerful in the classroom. When the child does something good, you give them a reward. All the other kids see it and they will definitely want to get that reward too. So they definitely follow what, what you say. They, if you want them to recite something, if you want them to stand up, whatever it is that you want them to do, they also follow you and then they do the same thing just to get the rewards at the end of it. So rewards are a powerful thing and you really can use that for your classroom. The next thing, point number five, is strategic punishment, which won't disrupt the class. I call it strategic because sometimes you might try to affect a particular punishment, but in the end, it will just affect the whole energy of the classroom or it will just disrupt the class, disrupts another kid's attention and everything becomes a mess. So this particular one has to be really strategic. So for example, when one child is talking too much or one child is not paying attention, I would quickly just talk to that one child. So for example, John, stand up, hurry up, stand up. And then I'll continue to teach. It's John who's not paying attention. It's not the other kid. So if you don't make it a little strategic, you in turn tend to affect the whole class. So it has to be strategic and it should not disrupt the class. What you can do is try to talk to one child to get them to stand up, get them to jump, get them to do something. Whoever it is that's the problem, you have to try and find means to affect that one child so that 
all the others don't get disrupted. Number six, the teacher's loud voice. Words must make sense. I've seen this done so many times. Teachers often just shout at the kids for no reason at all. I understand the fact that maybe the child is being noisy or the child is doing something they're not supposed to be doing in class. But first of all, it has to be words that make sense. So for example, when I shout at John and say and tell John to keep quiet, it makes sense because John knows that the teacher is agitated or angry and the teacher wants them to keep quiet. I'm saying it should make sense because if it doesn't make sense, then the child now feels like you're attacking him or her. So whatever it is that whatever reason for whatever reason you raise your voice at the child it has to make sense and trust me kids actually do respond to the loud voice i'm sometimes really surprised how effective actually that could be number seven is the exclusion chair or a reasonable tread so sometimes what i do is i'll take a particular chair one chair and i'll say that whoever talks is going to sit on this chair at this place in this corner in front of the class or wherever at the back, wherever you choose to place the particular chair. And I say tread, maybe tread is a strong word, but the whole idea is that whoever does not do what is required of the whole class is going to be left out, you know, it's going to be isolated. The whole idea is isolation from the entire group, from the fun that everyone else is having. So that is the whole idea behind the exclusion chair, which is a reasonable tread. Now, number eight is use a Chinese main class teacher if she's any good, particularly if they fear her. So don't try to do everything yourself. That's the whole idea behind this. So I've encountered situations in which I've tried to do the class control myself, especially in the beginning when you don't have that clout with the kids yet and you try to do the class control yourself. Sometimes it can get messy, especially with the really stubborn ones who don't just badge. It can get really messy so what you can do at first is to use the class teacher let the class teacher be the one to say everyone sit down everyone stand up don't you hear what teacher william is saying everybody listen to teacher let in the beginning let it be the class teacher who gives control over to you don't just badge in and try to take over okay so that's for number eight so number nine let the kids participate in the teaching process by holding flashcards or distributing stickers particularly good for noisy or sleeping kids. This is something I've learned to do a lot of, is to, to involve the kids in the teaching. Then this actually makes a lot of things much easy. If you leave that noisy kid alone, you have to keep shouting at that kid to keep quiet. You'd have to keep finding means and ways to get that kid to conform with the class. But for example, if you just give the bunch of stickers to the child and say, Whoever is good is going to get a sticker from John. Now John is attentive and John is paying attention to you. And what I usually say is, John, you look out. If someone says it properly, if someone says it so well, give them a sticker. So now John has something to do instead of whatever is making John distracted. So this is one method that you can use. Letting the kids, you know, just hold their flashcards in many ways. Let the children be part of the teaching process and it makes a lot of things easy not even just the stubborn ones also the good ones because for example if you give a good kid the flashcard to pass around the next time it's coming around the noisy kid also wants to be the one who passes it around so this works really well it's something that you can use number 10 make the class fun it's the most effective this is the most effective method of class control in my opinion in my opinion this is the one that works really well which is making the class fun all the children are really into the class and therefore they have no time to think about something else usually the problem with class control is leaving the child with nothing to do that is actually the problem because what exactly is class control which is something i talked about in my video which is the control mindset so for example if you leave the child to sit down alone by themselves and do nothing, that's not going to work. Even for adults, that, <laughs> that hardly works. Imagine someone puts you in a room and says, sit there for six hours and do nothing. For you at six hours, for that child, two minutes is similar to that six hours. So just having them sit down and do nothing really doesn't make sense, especially when their friends are sitting next to them. So what you can do is 
the very interesting class just engages the children and prevents them from having time or attention from for other things. So, in my opinion, if you would, the best thing you can do is to have a really interesting class. But it's not always like that, is it? Sometimes we don't have the energy and time and idea and mindset for an interesting class. It doesn't always happen, which is just normal. So number 11, which I wish I'd put at the end of this document is do nothing. And sometimes I find that doing nothing is really effective because in my opinion, I've found that there are certain kids who actually crave attention. I've had the time to actually observe a lot of kids and I remember really well, there's a child in my VIP class who actually <laughs> gets a kick out of, you know, constantly giving them attention and constantly scolding them. So sometimes, sometimes you can intentionally ignore a particular child. Sometimes you can let the kids play for like five or 10 minutes and then you can continue the class. Sometimes instead of scolding that one child who's playing, just leave that child alone. Sometimes doing nothing works. It's not always, you really shouldn't do this always, but trust me, sometimes it works to just do nothing. Number 12 is a quick activity such as jump, run, turn around. So sometimes what I do is when the kids are not paying attention, I know they like to jump. I know they like to run and turn around and hop and skip and all of that. So what I'll do is I'll let everybody stand up, making a sound, whoop, everyone is up and then say, let's jump, 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 jump. Let's run, 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 run. You know, just a side activity, something you know that the kids really love. You can just push that through the class, <laughs> through the lesson. You can just... Let that swoop into the lesson and then it's gone. Just do that once to get the attention and then you continue. It's just like the call and response, just that this one takes a little more time. So the next one is to play a short cartoon. This actually works best or it works only when you have a TV in your classroom. I don't think everyone has a TV in their classroom. Most ESL environments have a TV in the classroom because of the nature of the lesson. Uh, I think this works really well. The kids or students just love to watch something interesting. So for the kids, there are certain cartoons. You know, I have some cartoons from supersimple.com. I will just open their website and then I'll just let the kids watch. What I do is I don't let them watch everything throughout. So for example, they know the sound. Uh, they know certain sounds that the cartoons make. So when you start that one, the moment they hear it, they all pay attention because they know it's a cartoon coming right up. And when the cartoon just begins, for maybe 10 seconds, when they're into it, then I stop the cartoon. And then I start to teach. Okay, what word is this? This is fish. This is ball. This is dog. Once I see their attention drifting, I go back to the video and I start playing the video again. Dun, 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 dun. And then the attention gets back to the video. After 10 seconds or so, I'll just pause the video and then I'll have them recite the word again. So whatever it is that you do to get the attention, because that is the whole idea or the mindset behind class control is to get their child's attention and hold it for the lesson you are teaching. It's not just to let the child sit down quietly and do nothing. The next one is good cop, bad cop. Hmm. The question is, which of them are you going to be? It's, if everyone is good cop, mm, then it's not really effective. If everyone is bad cop, then the children lose interest in the lesson and they're afraid and all of that. So actually, I find that with my nature, my temperament for teaching, what I do is I like to be, you know, all outgoing and happy and jumpy and runny and happy and all that. So it doesn't work well when I'm bad cop because now I have to transform my mood uh, to, you know, let the children think teacher William is angry. Everybody should keep quiet. And it becomes a whole, the, there's tension in the classroom and now the children, even though they are focusing, cannot really enjoy the class and therefore their effectiveness kind of dips and all that. So I prefer when the class teacher is the bad cop. And some teachers don't want to be that because everyone wants to be the one the children like, but the children like, but there has to be a good cop and a bad cop. It, it's most effective that way. So that's what you can do. One person or the teacher, hey, whichever one works best for you. Either you are the one who is strict and the class teacher is the one who is passing the fun part into the 
into the lesson or you're gonna have to be the fun person that draws the children in and whenever they are misbehaving the mean teacher comes in as the bad cop this works well in my case number 15 class setting one boy one girl reshuffle so i found that a lot of times when the same gender sits together it's more likely that they would talk and converse and there's more chaos as compared to when there's one boy or one girl and also when it's like that it kind of it kind of gives the idea that okay teacher wants you to be serious it kind of conditions the mind of the children to pay attention to the class and sometimes when one child is not paying attention in that instant when two children are you know chatting you can just let one stand up another kid stands up and then they change positions just in that instant it also works there's something you'd be surprised how effective this actually can get because first of all when they change positions it lets that child know that hey you're doing something teacher doesn't like number 16 use the demographics of kids attitude control the very stubborn lower 15 percent i'm sure you know already that not every child in your classroom is stubborn there are, there are few of them who are really obedient they can control themselves they pay attention to the class and there's the middle percent who are the masses who kind of either sway either way, depending on what is going on in the class. So what you want to do is make sure the lower 15% are always engaged and you don't leave that lower 15% to do whatever they like. So that's where giving of stickers comes in. That's where uh, giving the stickers to that particular child or the lower 15% to actually participate in the class in, in some way. What you want to do is actually get the attention of that 15%. Whenever class begins to get rowdy, what you want to do is look to those 15% and look at what is happening with those 15%. You need to know those particular children. There could be two, there could be three or four or five, whatever. I don't know the class sizes that you have, but you have to pay attention to that particular group because you can almost certainly know that when class gets messy almost every time, assess with them so you need to know those kids and know what to do about them number 17 teach enough songs and rhymes that a greater part of the class can sing so you can fall back on as class control to get kids attention i find that this also works and it works only when you have taught the class a lot of songs or enough rhymes and all that that you can use during the lesson so for example one of the rhymes that i have is see you later alligator Bye bye butterfly. And then they say who who gorilla. You know, that particular action just gets every child's attention. So whenever I, I feel the class is getting a little rowdy and nothing else is working, I start see you later. And then everyone joins in. Or it could be a song. There are more, we get together, and everyone sings. And this can be something that you can fall back on to control your classroom or to get the kids' attention. Number 18. Treat kids as kids, but also as persons who think and feel, but just on their level of current development. Keep your expectations. Keep your expectations because kids are kids. They tend to learn one thing and forget. You can say, keep quiet. The next moment, they've forgotten. You can say, who wants this reward? Okay, you have to keep quiet. They do it, they get a reward, and then they forget what comes next. So, they are kids, so you have to keep your expectations. You have to know what to expect of them. Know that kids will be kids that's number one and you have to know that although they are kids they're not thinking okay i'm a kid so i have to they don't think like that they just think as we are people we are persons i'm i'm a ch I'm, I'm a person not just i'm a kid i'm a person so you have to sometimes treat the kids as kids but also as persons who think on their own level at their level they feel they must play and do whatever so you have to expect that from them and know how to work around that if they like to play more activities that involve them using that energy they have for the lesson so this is something also that works so number 19 excessive praise with resources such as stickers for good performing kids during the lesson it's good to apply this when kids don't really like english yet and don't use this every time so the reason why is actually for the good performing kids is because the bad the bad ones i actually should say the good the ones with good attitude because when you give it to those ones it doesn't really change much they just take the stickers and continue to play 
So the excessive thing must apply to the really good kids because they would be the one participating the most anyways. And actually, the more you give to those ones, the more the other ones also will want to participate to get it. So you give more to the really good kids and you gradually give to the other ones as they participate, as they continue to join the class. Because if you straight up give it to them, then you very soon lose them again. So I've talked about these 19 methods. These are the things that I actually do in my classroom. And you have to know that all of these are situational. Depending on what situation you encounter, you can pick one of these and then you apply to your situation. So thank you very much for watching this one. I'll catch you in the next one. Love and peace.